believe in a serious art day. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Twice as long as before we still Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Now try. Thank you. 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father's and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not just worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. We see you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> Jesus. 
If everyone in the large crowd who heard him that day had taken him at his word, then I'm not sure we would be here today, because most of them would have turned away, and the few who followed would have been dead in a few years, as extinct as holy events. Instead, I think some of those who heard him that day knew that they could not follow him. They had families they did not hate, lives they still loved, and possessions that meant a great deal to them. They may have admired people who could walk away from all that, but they knew that they were not such people. So they went home instead of to Jerusalem. Some of them, no doubt, believed to have had a choice, but so starkly that there really was no choice. While others could not stop thinking about what it would have felt like to step out of the crowd, to step right up to Jesus without checking with anyone else first and say, okay, I'll do it. Let's go. Given the choice between softening his call so that they could all believe they had answered it, and preserving its hard, uncompromising beauty, even if that put it out of their reach, the friends of the disciples chose the latter. They did not go to Jerusalem. They went home instead to catch fish, to have babies, and to start churches. They went home to tell other people what Jesus had said and done so that his living word continued to rouse new generations of disciples and friends. Along the way, they found a third way to live with his high call to discipleship, neither turning away from it nor lowering it, but allowing it to shimmer high over their heads, where it provoked them, disturbed them, inspired them, and strangely reassured them. They may not have followed Jesus to Jerusalem, but their hearts did. Even if they had counted the cost of following him and come up short, he changed their lives all the same. It's why we are still here today, because of the disciples, certainly. But even more so, because of the friends, who were people more like us, after all. And who discovered, like us, that God's love is as free as rain. There is no extra reward for following. The following is its own reward. Brown's interpretation is a more honest assessment of my own good today. I have not given up all of my possessions, nor do I have any intention of disowning my family, through whom I come to know God better on a daily basis. But this more honest assessment also does not let us off the hook. If we are more accurately friends of the disciples, as Brown describes the majority of us, that still informs who we are called to be. Through the gospel narratives, we encounter countless stories of Jesus' interactions with large crowds of people who did not become disciples, those who listened to him preach, those who were healed by him, those who witnessed a healing, those who shared a meal with him, and those who followed where he traveled. An official count might tell us that only 14 times did these interactions result in a disciple leaving everything to follow him. Every other time, he sent the people back home to tell everyone what God had done for them. Statistically speaking, we can infer that the friends of the disciples were fantastic storytellers, because there were a lot of people that were disciples. This makes me wonder about the ways in which they used words to convey those stories. I wonder whether it was over a meal, or what gathered at the well, or over an altar in one of the very first house churches. I wonder about the ways in which they did not use words, but did their best to mimic that which they had experienced in Jesus donating some of their earnings to a family who had lost everything, sharing a meal with those whom they had previously overlooked, or modeling forgiveness and grace for their children. Though the church might have us believe otherwise, I think, I think it is the friends of the disciples, all of those who have gone unnamed, who help us get here today. This morning, instead of dismissing this text, too much, or is meant for someone who 
is more faithful than you. I hope you'll use it as a catalyst to wonder about how your life shares the good news that we have come to know, Jesus. Perhaps another way to do that is to think about the ones who have provoked, inspired, disturbed, and reassured you about this call to share both your faith and the stories of the wonderful things that God has done for you. Of course, the examples of the Teresas, the Martins, the Bonhoeffers, and the Romeros of the world serve as a beacon upon a hill. But I'm more curious about the people with whom you live and work, these parents. Who are the ones in your midst with whom you can subtly and faithfully share the good news? How else might you use your actions, not necessarily having to worry about words, to share God's love? As Barbara Brown's Kimber reminds us, there is another way, a third way to live with this high call to discipleship, neither turning away from it nor lowering it, but allowing it to shimmer high over our heads. Amen. <laughs> Remember for good those who are in the 
coming down and raising the arm.